think we're going to find fascinating stories about different ethnic groups and how, how each one of us built the city. Central Avenue, um, for African Americans, this would be the first place that you would actually come. A place where you could actually meet anyone um, that you were looking for was Central Avenue. It was really a home place where if you were brought to Los Angeles because of the lure of jobs and sunshine and kind of a relaxed racial atmosphere, you knew that Central Avenue had people that looked like you. Um, folks that were actually buying homes that had the highest home ownership rates in the country where 36% of the population actually owned homes in Los Angeles. And so this represented economic freedom, racial freedom, a kind of life where you could have um, work in the daytime and entertainment at night where you had everyone from Billie Holiday to Ella Fitzgerald to any major star that you could bump into on Central Avenue and it became the playground of Los Angeles because of all the entertainment and so really became this kind of um, world center when you really think about it for Hollywood and entertainment at night much the same way that Harlem functioned um, during the same time period. The Dunbar Hotel was built in 1928 uh, by Dr. John Somerville and his wife, Veda Somerville. The hotel in, in Lore is really much more about the entertainment community, but when it was built, it opened as the first West Coast site for the NAACP convention. The Ralph Bunch home isn't significant because of its architectural features. It's really significant because Ralph Bunch lived there. He was the first American to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950, and the American, one of the Americans to actually found the United Nations. And so it's important to South Los Angeles to recognize a hero, someone who grew up in their midst, went on to UCLA to become the valedictorian, and then went on to such fame as the United Nations and as the undersecretary, and also winning the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, after he wins the Nobel Peace Prize, Dr. King wins the Nobel Peace Prize. And you can actually find pictures of Dr. Bunch and Dr. King marching in Selma together side by side with um, uh, Rosa Parks and Coretta Scott King on the front lines as well. Central Avenue as it was in its heyday during the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and even into the 50s really doesn't look the same anymore. There's not a way to peel back those layers and really get a sense of what is the history of a corridor or a neighborhood. Survey LA will actually help in that regard and being able to put things together according to timeline, then to kind of cross-categorize that with architecture, and then being able to talk about the significance of place as well. The Far East Cafe has been here since 1923 and they've been operating as a Chinese restaurant since the early 30s. It's the kind of restaurant where my grandfather came to eat here, my father brought me here, uh, I brought my daughter here and I'd like to bring my grandkids if I ever have any to come here. So, you know, there's not many restaurants where you can say we had five generations. And if you said the Far East Cafe, let's go to the Far East, to any Japanese American anywhere in Southern California. They knew where it was, they knew what it was, they knew what the food was, and it just became famous. It became a, kind of a set, social center of the whole community. We were able to get the restaurant opened up on the ground floor, and then uh, next to the restaurant was also another storefront, so we've been using that as our computer training center. And then upstairs we have uh, 16 units of special needs housing. Now it used to be an old SRO hotel, and it was shut down for many, many years, uh, but we were able to get a rehab so that uh, now it's used for homeless and mentally ill and special needs uh, handicapped folks. So it provides a, a service now in the upper floors. We have the computer center on the ground floor plus the, plus the restaurant. So we're hoping that all of that will mix together to keep this building alive. Little Tokyo is still here, um, but you know, there's an example uh, there used to be a little Italy here in Los Angeles, just north of Chinatown, and, uh, but it's gone now. Uh, there's, a, there's a few buildings that have like the Italian Hall and things like that, 
but little Italy is gone and I think to me that kind of represents the sense that what did Italians contribute to this society or to this area and we don't want that to happen to little Tokyo the Japanese American community was very prominent here in the development of Los Angeles it represents a community and a culture that's been here for over a hundred years so we want to keep that in some fashion or some shape This is a marvelous example of a Episcopal church built in 1888. It is an example of, of the type of material and quality that was built at the time. It's still standing today, strong as ever. But just as significant, it's what happened in these walls, what happened in this place. It was a center of much political activity during the 1960s. Cesar Chavez actually stood on this altar, held a whole group of sessions to organize people when we had the great, great boycotts of the 60s. The significance of this building and buildings like this is that we are able to share this with our youngsters. Our youngsters are in a place where they are not aware of the value of these buildings. So we are able to share with them the history. That history is knowledge. And that knowledge allows them to understand you know, a stronger sense of of identity, increases their self-esteem, and it raises their conscious level as to where they're at as a community. Instead of it viewing it as a throwaway community that you could just tag and, and destroy, they have a reason to preserve it, to have pride in it. We're in uh, my field office at Hollywood and Western uh, in the historic Louis B. Mayer building. It was built in 1928, the same year that City Hall was constructed um, by Louis B. Mayer before he joined MGM. And this building has an amazing history. Norma Shearer helped open uh, up the, uh, the building when it first was uh, christened. But then later years it turned into central casting. So literally we are right here straight out of central casting uh, every day in Hollywood and it was an important intersection near where a lot of the early filming uh, happened in the heart of Hollywood. Having a historic survey will benefit us in, in two ways. One, it will provide us with knowledge, whether it's a tourist who's coming to Los Angeles to see part of our history or whether it's somebody who's a fourth or fifth generation Angelino, uh, like myself, wanting to know more about his or her city. It will give us that knowledge, that roadmap, um, and a way to navigate LA um, and understand our past. But secondly, it will also help us preserve that past by flagging those assets that we have. Uh, when there's redevelopment or a proposed project going on, we will immediately know what the historical significance of buildings and streets and neighborhoods are. Right now, that has been somewhat of a guessing game or it's been uh, uneven. And those who might have knowledge about a particular building come forward, but the city hasn't done that in a comprehensive way. So now we will have the tools to understand our entire city and its history.